Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, last year, I did a, a talk about the Kennel Club in front of 500 welfare activists. And um, I have to say, this is far more intimidating because I'm talking to people. Uh, it's a very intimate setting, which means that you can uh, throw things at me. But also, you are people who are just as versed in the breed as I am. And Mark says that, you know, I, I, I know a lot and I'm a good person to do this, but it's not necessarily the case. There are people here um, who've, done, who've been to as many trophy shows as I have. And I did quite a lot of research to get actually this information together because rather oddly, it's not actually recorded anywhere. And I had to get it from lots of different sources. Um, my first show was the 1979 trophy show. Um, uh, it means I've been to almost half of them. I've missed two. I missed last year and I missed one month before. Um, but it does mean that if I do attend two more trophies, I will have been to half of the region trophies. I'm actually quite proud of that. It's quite something to have been to that many shows. Um, when I started doing the research for this, it suddenly started occurring to me that... Ah, oh, that's better. Um, why did we start dog shows? What, what, where did the region trophy really start? And actually, it made me think a little bit about why dog, why dog shows did start. And it was really, it was born, you've got to go back to the 1800s, and everybody literally worked with all everything, anything that anybody did. It was all about work, uh, particularly in industrial England. And even the whole family would go to work. The mum, dad, children would all be out of work in factories. And the Factories Act actually changed that because it started a mandate actual time off for people. People had free time for the first time. And people being people, we like to fill our time with, with hobbies. Um, it did actually, a lot of the entertainment in those days was around, circulated around pubs and centred around pubs. And that wasn't necessarily the best place for people to hang around in. They were pretty awful places. Um, but actually that's where some of the dog shows actually did start. It actually started in the pubs. Um, and it, the idea of dog shows was it actually, they did actually give something, a little bit of a target, something to aim for and some activity to be involved in. Um, the first shows were actually just working gun dogs and that's not surprising because you have to think, you have to get your head around this a little bit. Actually, this, we're going back to the time when actually breeds hadn't really developed into breeds in the way we understand them. They were really types of dog. And, Types of dog have been around for many, many years. You can go back to, the, to Egypt where the greyhounds first started, but they weren't breeds defined in the same way that they are today. Um, and why the bull breeds actually um, formed a good part of the early dog show scene was simply because they were involved in some of the blood sports. And literally when the, the fight, dog fights weren't taking place, bull baiting wasn't taking place, and the rat pits had started to... Uh, closed down, people started to take their dogs, and the nights that they weren't contest on, people would actually compare their dogs with each other, and that's how dog shows really started. Um, I mentioned, I will mention there were other parts, I'm talking about the bull breeds, the terriers, that's how they started shows, but the toy dog show started, scene started in late, in grand houses, and that's why Queen Victoria is one of the early adopters of dog shows. Um, the first ever show that there's any record of was in the Elephant in Castle in London in 1834. Um, that was just a dog show, no breeds identified, it was just a, a show for dogs. And uh, the first record that the Kennel Club actually has of dog shows, and they actually started recording dog shows um, historically. The first ones that they actually started recording was um, in June uh, 1859. That was a show for pointers and setters, so very few breeds as I say. Um, interestingly, in, uh, the, the other next two shows I could find a record of were in, um, in 1859, and they were both run by the same man, a Mr. Browsford, who actually won both shows as well. So I can imagine that made him rather popular. Um, but those early shows, they were nothing like the shows today. They had absolutely no records. Uh, that there would be a list of winners, but it would simply just be the man who turned up with a dog, and it may be Mr. Browsford or whoever. Um, but there was nothing to record the dogs as well. They had no pedigrees, they had no names, or rather they did have names, but I might turn up with my dog called Billy, and someone else would turn up with their dog called Billy. There was no record or way to record those animals. Um, we, I then turn to this man. This man is, is um, Mr. Shirley. Um, 
I have to say, the world of dog shows in those days was, a, was fairly murky. The world of dog breeding was fairly, a fairly murky business. And these people, even James Hinks, these people were, were really dealers in dogs. Um, we'd have a very poor opinion of them today, but they weren't breeders as we understand. They were people who were just selling dogs as a commodity. Um, they were, I, I'd refer to them as rogues and vagabonds. Um, I'm not suggesting Mr. Shirley was a vagabond, but he was an MP. You might say that's the same thing. <laughs> Um, but he actually started the Kennel Club, and he, all he did, he got together with a group of his friends um, who were also kennel owners and said, we need, a, we need to sort these dog shows out. It's absolute anarchy. Uh, we can't keep going, turning up to these shows. We don't know who owns the dogs. We have no record of the dogs. Um, and they started a kennel club. Now, Mr. Shirley was interested in, in bull breeds. He had bulldogs, bull terriers, and he actually bred the first bull terrier champion, uh, a dog called uh, Champion Nelson. Um, he was actually a small dog by today's standards. He would probably say today say he was a miniature. He was the first champion bull terrier recorded. But if you imagine, if you are the chairman of the kennel club that you started, and you've got a dog called Nelson, I say he may probably have had a fairly easy route to becoming a champion. Um, so the kennel club, it was started in 1873. Mr. Shirley became champion and he, he remained there for 30 years. After that, he became president when he finished as, as chairman. But at that time, we, they start, the kennel club started to record um, dogs, pedigrees, in what they called a stud book. And that stud book still exists today. Um, but interestingly, breed clubs had actually started many years before the kennel club. And when you think about it, that makes sense because you've got a group of people who've got a common interest they form a group and a club, and it wasn't until after those breed clubs were formed that the kennel club came along. Um, there was quite a lot of conflict between the breed clubs and the kennel club. The Bulldog Club in, in, in particular, and it's a breed that I know, I know quite a lot of people involved in the Bulldog breed, and I can tell you the Bulldog people today are still often at odds with the kennel club, um, but it, it's hardly surprising because for many years, um, Quite understandably, the Bulldog Club said, well, hang on, we own, you can run dog shows, but we own the breed standard, it's our breed, you, just, you can't tell us about our breed. And that's, to a certain extent, that situation still exists today. Um, I will say immediately, it's a slightly different situation in the UK than it is in other countries, because in the UK, the Kennel Club has owned, adopted the breed standards. In other countries, the standards belong to breed clubs, and both situations um, actually create their own problems. Bull Terrier Club started in 1862, it was the first Bull Terrier Club. The Northern Provincial have often claimed they were older than the Bull Terrier Club, but um, there's very little evidence to actually suggest that. Uh, first AGM was in 18, uh, 1888, um, and by 1915, 60 members, it was very much a southern-based club. And interestingly, it was actually not just for Bull Terriers, it was for miniature Bull Terriers as well. So it was about promoting both varieties of the breed. Um, one thing I'm very proud of, I'm, I work for the Kennel Club now and I'm, in, I'm involved in the health of dogs and we are often trying to prove, improve the health of dogs and as you know dog breeders get accused of lots of things of breeding unhealthy dogs. Right from the very start the, the Bull Terrier Club had a rule that you couldn't exhibit deaf dogs and that went on to becoming a rule where you couldn't um, breed from deaf dogs. So actually I'd like to say that I'm very proud of the fact that the Bull Terrier community at a very early stage said, hang on a minute, we're interested in health as well. It's not just about, we want to improve dogs. It's not just about making dogs look, into, you know, after a certain, having a certain appearance. Um, by 1988, interestingly, the, the Bull Terrier Club had 2,500 members. I believe, I can't find a record, I believe at one time it was as high as 4,000 members. I do know it was at one time the largest terrier club in the world, not just the bull, largest bull terrier club. Um, so, um, we have a Bull Terrier Club, along comes this man, uh, Dr. Vivas. Now, Dr. Vivas, he hadn't been around very long when he joined the committee of the, of the Bull Terrier Club. He was a very influential man. Um, it's very difficult to put it in perspective how uh, well known he was, but at that time, you've got to remember there was no television, no social media in those days. He was quite a well-known character, he, he published books, he was extremely well respected, and therefore I think the, the Bull Terrier Club were probably very keen and very proud to have him involved. He was the uh, curator of the Regent's Park Zoo, that's where the uh, Regent affix comes from, obviously. And um, Dr. Vivas de decided that he would donate a trophy to the Bull Terrier Club. Um, 
At the bottom there, you'll see what Raymond Oppenheimer said about him. Few people could have done as much for our breed, and I suppose that no man living can have done as much for our club. And I think, even today, we would have to say, we're all here this weekend to actually come along to the Regent Trophy. Um, actually, that man had a massive impact, even to this day. And I've been coming to his show, if you like, for, uh, for 40 years. Um, so, the original trophy, it was... Um, I can't find too much information, and what I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this, the talk I give today, we, I can build on it, because I, there's lots of information, I think, that's sitting around in books. I've done a lot of research. I'd really like to find out where the actual original trophy came from. But it was interesting to me that um, one of the rules was that um, if the, the, a, a replica trophy, the Royal Infenberg Porcelain Trophy, would be given if at obtainable. And that's quite a lot of foresight, because um, when you think about it, I wouldn't like to suggest something is going to be available today and it's definitely going to be available in 50 years' time. Thankfully, Royal Infantburg trophies are still available. Um, so it's actually, and I think that's one of the things that makes the trophy such an important thing to actually win. And it actually adds to the history of the trophy um, that you do get, the winner gets a, a, an Infantburg trophy. And I have to say, of all the things I have in my house, apart from my wife, of course, uh, the one thing that would be that I would never let go would be my Regent Trophy, something I'm very proud of. So, there's the first winner of the Regent Trophy, Brendan Becky, um, bred by uh, a lady called Mrs. Adam, Granny Addy. And Grant, if you read the books, you'll think that Granny Addy was a very sweet old lady. Um, but she was a dog breeder, and like all dog breeders, there's lots of little stories about her. <coughs> um, the, probably the be best known story is the fact that she would she had a trip when she used to sell a puppy. Um, what would happen, she would uh, interview someone, particularly if it was a nice wealthy man from London, and then she'd suddenly say to the maid, maid, I want you to go and get little Alfie. And the maid would say, Alfie, ma'am? Yes, go and get Alfie. But Alfie's the best bull terrier you've ever bred. Yes, no, I want this man to have Alfie. <laughs> this is the best puppy, and this man deserves Alfie. But of course, this man would be very impressed and, oh, I want to have Alfie. But of course, Alfie was much more expensive than the puppy that he'd actually gone to have. So there's a sweet old lady and, and perhaps some of those old dog breeding habits had actually uh, gone on to the slightly later days of the trophies, of the uh, dog, dog breeding, rather. So that's the first winner. Um, at this time, the trophy was just given by the, it was, it was um, awarded by the committee of the Bull Terrier Club. There was no competition as such. They would simply select the best dog of that year. There was no show as such. It was actually given at the National Terrier Club show. And the National Terrier Club show at that time was in London. And they would just turn up and say, right, we've had a discussion and this dog here is winning it. And sometimes the doggy wouldn't even be present at the show. So it was a, a system, it was for the best dog of the year, but I can imagine, and I might try and put yourselves into that position, how would you feel if suddenly the Bull Terrier Club just said, oh, that, we're going to nominate that dog this year. It wouldn't really add to the competition, and I can imagine that Dr. Vivas himself, it probably didn't pan out in the way that he wanted it to. Um, you can see some of the earlier winners there that you see features very heavily is the Gardenia Kennel. They won it three times, that's uh, Harry and Rose Potter won it three times um, in the early years. So it was a trophy that was dominated by um, a, a number of large kennels. Um, the Dog Ring Fire of Bright is an interesting one. He had a brother, two brothers in fact, one called Rubislaw, who was an excellent sire, and another brother uh, called Abedonian, I think. Um, but he was, he was obviously the better show dog. He was the dog that was more uh, successful at shows. Um, so, for 10 years, the trophies donated, just literally awarded to the best dog by the committee. And then in uh, 1939, the Bull Terrier Club committee decided, no, we're going to have a competition. And this dog was the first dog, Ormandy's Mr. McGuffin was the first dog to actually win the trophy in a competition. So I think he deserves a special place in history. Um, that was the rule, uh, to be awarded by a panel of three judges selected from the committee of the Bull Terrier Club. It was not, there was not a selection process for actual for competitors to actually compete. So it was actually just given by the judges in the ring. 
Uh, the first three judges, very well, very well known, influential people. There's Harry Potter who'd won it three times, Mrs. Eris Kenyon who'd had guards in the work of a region trophy winner, and a guy called Bob Justice who'd owned two very famous dogs of the time. Um, right, so we, we invent the region trophy, it comes along, it's here, we have the first one in open, open competition and suddenly we have a war and all dog shows are suspended. Um, it's interesting that the last championship dog show was held on the 2nd of September, the very next day war was declared. So shows actually didn't go away completely, the Bull Terrier Club became dormant, um, all canine activities ceased nationally but there were still some local shows and dogs would, would show locally at, local, at, at shows. There was actually a 25 mile range, you couldn't travel to a dog show for more than 25 miles so dogs in the north would never come up against the dogs in the south for example. War finishes, in fact slightly before war finished, dog show started again. Bull Terror Club was reformed, it held another show, it held its first championship show in Buckingham Gate in London and there were 102 Bull Terrors and 21 miniatures there. So actually it was quite a good entry in, for those days. Um, and there's the first Regent Trophy winner, Ormondis Kertrin Bosom. Now Bosom was actually quite a lucky dog. Um, and I'm saying, I should immediately say, I'm going to make comments about dogs, that some of them will be my opinion, and please don't shoot me, it is my opinion, but some of it will be opinion that I've gained from, from books and rumour and speculation and, and general sort of history around that dog. Um, but he, I think it's fair to say he was considered a lucky winner, but there's very good reason for that, because at that time, there were a lot of other dogs being shown that had actually been shown in previous years and the rule was that it, the Regent Trophy was for the best dog shown the previous year but you had the war year so you had three, four, five, six year old dogs that had been shown in many years and these dogs were probably better than Boson because they didn't qualify he didn't actually have to compete against them so in that respect I say he was a lucky, a very lucky winner to give you some flavour of that, some of the dogs that were around in those war years were Romany Reliance, the Nave of Ormandy, South Dean Lucky Patch, Gambit of or or uh, Orion. So these were really famous, influential dogs that actually Ring Fire never actually, act uh, sorry, Boson never had to actually compete against. So I think it's fa fair to say he was a fairly lucky dog. Um, following year, another controversial winner, Pictish Peony. Pictish Peony was the first coloured uh, champion, sorry, she so wasn't the first coloured champion, she was the first coloured region trophy winner, but she never did become a champion. And I suspect there was a good reason for that. Coloureds were treated um, very poorly in those days. There was a huge split in the breed where the coloured bull terror should even be allowed, let alone should compete. They weren't, and previous, in previous years, they hadn't been allowed to compete. But once they were allowed to compete, and we had a winner, it was very controversial and I can imagine that's probably one of the reasons that she never became a champion because there was probably a lot of antipathy towards her. Uh, there's no suggestion that she wasn't a worthy winner but actually there, it was, I, th I think there's a very good chance it did affect her, uh, her, her show career after that. Interesting, the hot favourite that year was a bitch called Louise of Ormandy. Louise of Ormandy didn't compete and Raymond says in McGuffin & Co for some inexplicable reason. So he, it, it, clearly it wasn't a bitch that was owned by him and he, he I dare say he fell out with the owner or some, something happened there in the background. So she, did, so she was the, perhaps the favourite. I think the point I'm trying to make is that uh, the, the Regent Trophy is for the best dog of the year and we love to see the best dog of the year but sometimes circumstances conspire. You can be lucky, you can be unlucky. Um, you have to be a pretty good dog, but don't ever think that it's a foregone conclusion what will win because things happen along the way. Um, one thing I will mention, just when we're on the coloured issue, at that time the Bull Terrier Club classes were split into white to predominate, white not to predominate. So actually they'd, rec they'd recognise that there were coloured Bull Terriers, but they had this very slow entry into becoming acceptable. So, we go on to the next few years, and here's, these are all the winners of the next few years, and I'll just pick out a couple for various reasons. Um, Wooden William, another dog that never became a champion. There's no suggestion that he shouldn't have won the trophy, um, but he was actually, um, he didn't actually go on to become a champion. So I, I think he's one of those dogs that 
wasn't necessarily lucky. He was a popular winner of the trophy. And largely he was popular because his breeder, Miss Woods, was a very popular lady and she'd, been, she'd done a lot for the breed. Um, but actually he, he wasn't necessarily uh, one of, considered one of the top dogs around. Um, in 1950, the rules changed so that colour-bred whites, and that's white dogs that are from colour parents, they could actually compete in the trophy. Until that point, they couldn't actually compete. So it just goes to show you some of the attitudes that existed towards coloured dogs in those days. Um, the 1953 winner, um, Cash Dow's White, White Rock, he's a favourite dog of mine purely because there's a very, my favourite Bull Terrier book is a, dog, a book called The Dogs of Coolin Hill. And um, it's written by, the, uh, by Jesse Bennett, uh, who was an American breeder. Cash Down White, White Rock was uh, exported to America, became very successful, signed 11 champions. Um, but he was, if you ever get the chance to read that book, The Dogs of Coolin Hill, I suggest you do, because it really is one of my favourite books. Um, the 1954 winner, Snow Flash, he was considered a really great dog, and he was actually the last of the purebred white dogs. So he had no colour blood in his pedigree at all, but he was the last one of, the, of that line. Um, we go on to the next few years. Um, nine, by now, the, start, the show had started to move around. The 1955 show moved to Central Baths Hall, East Finchley. I would say the show is always in London at this time, it's always around the London area. Nevertheless, people would still travel from Scotland, from, from Cornwall, to go to the trophy show. It had that much interest. Um, and in those days, travelling around, or the years before that, travelling around wasn't that easy. It was quite common for people to travel to shows on trains, for example. And I can't imagine, we all complain about the roads today and how long it takes us to get home. Well, it could take you a couple of days to get to and from a show in those days. So I think these people were pretty dedicated. Um, again, well, I'll pick out some winners here. Um, Sparrow, Ormandy Superlative Sparrow, he was considered perhaps a bit lucky because he was up against a bitch called Fidgety Snow Dream, who was considered the top bitch. But actually, she was unlucky. In the day of the show, she had a very bad abscess on her side, and the judges felt that they couldn't forgive her that. But she was, probably went on to be considered a much better bitch. Um, but however, I will say Sparrow produced the following year's winner. Um, Fidgety Sky High. So he was he had some value in his own right without a doubt. I don't want to de I don't want to decry him and say he wasn't a, wasn't a great dog because he was a very good dog. Um, gay Carolinda Gay Carolinda Gay Carolinda 1959. Um, she was considered a very worthy winner and absolute top dog. No one complained about it. But interestingly, she had not been invited for the Ormandy Jug that year, and that was quite a surprise. So she won one trophy. So when you think, when you complain these, these, these days, you hear people complaining, oh, this dog should have been invited, that dog should have been invited. There's always been a degree of controversy surrounding the trophy and the selection and the winners even. Um, by 1960, the show moved again, moved to the Porchester Baths at Queensway. That's actually a stone's throw away from the Kennel Club. I can't imagine these days trying to get everybody to go into central London to attend a dog show. Um, and, and, but it just goes to show how, how the world has changed and how, how our attitude to showing has changed. Um, move on to 63 now, and this is when we start to see, in my view, this, we start to see a shift from having this central um, London, um, southern-based winners of the trophies. Now, the Bull Terrier Club, rather cruelly, was called the Berkshire Bull Terrier Club by some of the people in the north. And it was considered at that time that there was a cartel that actually it was impossible for dogs from the north to win. And I think this is where we started to see things change because um, RD Resident Defender, he was a dog very much um, in the north of England, uh, owned by, uh, bred by Mrs. Riley, Dobberson, Riley Donovan, and he, who was from Stockport in Cheshire. And of course, by 1968, um, Target Silver Bob of Langville, um, he was the winner. And I see Eric's in the ring. Eric owned his brother, Tra uh, Trackvale's Barley Boy. Um, was he your first dog, Eric? Yeah. Yeah. So Eric started right at the top. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, it shows that we're, we're still only now in um, 1968. So Eric's been coming to the trophy show at least 10 years longer than me, and probably longer than that. 
And that's why I get very nervous because there's probably lots of people sitting there thinking, hang on a minute, that's not right. <laughs> um, so it, we start, I think this is where we start to see a shift of the dogs being in the south of England and moving to the north. I will mention White Knight of Leinster. Um, he's an interesting dog because he's another one that I would say was considered a fairly lucky winner. Um, that year, and I'm, I've tried to piece some of these things together, but uh, that year, sort of going, um, sorry, that, that year um, there, were, there was a, a big fallout between the Ormody Kennels and the Romady Kennels, and, and it was understandable why. They had very different types of dog, but um, Romany, I think it was River Pirate that year, uh, didn't actually compete in the trophy. He didn't even show up. He was made a puppy, he was made a champion as a puppy, and he was never shown again until a vet, he was a veteran. And if you read David Harris's book, he actually mentions that there was booing in the ring when a river pirate went in the ring. Now, looking back on it, river pirate was without doubt an outstanding dog. And I think that was just the antipathy, just the fallout between the Romany Kennels and the, the Ormany Kennels. And I'm glad, in a way, that neither of them are here to disagree with me. But I think it was just one of those things uh, that happened that can affect uh, the, the way the trophies actually fall and the, the little things that happen in the background that actually have an effect on the winners. Um, so, we, as I say, we start to see at this time a, a shift of dogs perhaps the trophies, the, 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 the hold that the south of England had on the trophies and on the world of bull terriers has started to move. Um, I have to mention this dog. This dog to me is quite an important dog because obviously he is the only bull terrier ever to win best in show at Crufts. Now to me this is quite important because uh, at the time, I was 13 years old at the time and we had a bull terrier and our bull terrier was actually um, a nephew of Audacity. Um, and at the time, for me as a, as a young boy, this was the most fantastic thing in the world. It was almost like I owned the best in show at Crufts and that gave me, amongst my mates, great celebrity status and bragging rights. I've got one, because until that point, people have thought my dog was the ugliest thing in the world and why do I have one of those odd dogs, those ugly dogs? At the time, we had, um, some of you in this room will remember that, Pedigree Chum used to advertise the Crufts winner on television. They used to do it very quickly, almost the following night after the Crufts show, they'd have an advert on television, and they, here would be the Crufts, and they used to call it the supreme best in show. And there was this great dog, and suddenly we see a bull terror, and not only is it a bull terror, it's related to my dog. So I had no interest in dog showing at that time, but you can imagine that really excited me and suddenly made me realise that there was something special about these dogs. Um, so we move on, um, and you can see immediately after Audacity's success, two more Braxless dogs win the Regent Trophy. So um, Violet Drum and Dick had actually won the trophy two year, three years in succession, which was quite a feat, obviously. First time it had ever been done. Um, again, I'm starting to talk about the, the move to the north. Caroline's schoolgirl was very much Edie Micklethwaite's uh, dog from Sheffield, uh, very much a northern dog. Um, I will let, I'm then going to talk a little bit about um, Jack, Jacobinia's win in 1976, slightly before I actually um, came, started to attend dog shows. But um, it was quite an influential dog for me because I went, Joan Kenway was really Carolyn and I's mentor in the breed. And really it started simply because her, their name was Kenway, our name was Lambert, we would be benched next to them um, on the benches at shows. And we got talking to him, and the, the Jabulu kennel was a very, very successful kennel at that time. And they had these two brothers, Jacobinia and Jack Minow, that appeared in the trophies. Um, I, the two dogs were outstanding dogs. I remember when I went to see them, this was after, the, after Jacobinia had won the Regent Trophy, I went to the Kenway's house, and we went out, we went into the, um, into the house, had some tea, and Jacobini was the most fantastic bull terrier I'd ever seen. He was so much better than any other dog. And I would still say that front-on photograph of Jacobini, remember that's 40 years old, I think that is still yet to be beaten. That, that expression and that front-on headshot of, is still fantastic. So I see this fantastic dog, he's sitting on my lap, we're having a great time. They take me out to the kennels, and there's an even better one. Jack Mino was this 
even better than the dog in the kennels. Now, interestingly, they won, uh, Jacobini won the Regent Trophy, Jack Minow won the Ormondy Jug. Joan would never actually ever say which one she preferred, but the fact was that Jack Minow was called Super Duper, even as a puppy, and he was known as Duper, so I suspect there's a little bit of a clue. The other thing I will say is that Jacobini was a a Jack Minow was a terrible show dog. He would not show in the ring. Um, Dominic Clark actually handled Jacobinia, and a dog that is Dominic here. No, he's not. Um, so he had, if you like, Jacobinia had the uh, handicap of being handled by Dominic, <laughs> <laughs> and yet he he still won the trophy. So it goes to show you that he must have been a pretty pretty good dog. Um, 19. 1977, Charles and Commander. Um, these days, if you go to, uh, these days, in this show tomorrow will be filmed. Everybody will have a film of the show on their camera. And by Monday, you'll be able to see film of the Regent Trophy anywhere around the, around the, around the world. Um, I mention this because in 1977, we had no film as such. Uh, cine, may, one or two people may have had cine film, but that was it. But if you want to see a film, of Charles in Commander, you can. We used to have a TV series on television called Rising Damp. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Um, a comedy show, Rising Damp, and they made a film of it. It's available on YouTube, and there is a scene in that film of Charles and Commander chasing someone into a river. The dog goes in the river as well, but Charles and Commander is that dog. So if you want to see a film of Charles and Commander, you can, and it's on YouTube. 1978, for me, was a very important year because that was the first ever trophy show that, that we ever attended. And I don't know, I can't, I look back on it now and I think, I can't believe I was so arrogant, but I thought that this bitch should never have won the Regent Trophy. There was another Brobar bitch called Brobar, a white rose of Brobar, who I personally thought was a better bitch. She was by Jacobinia, so I was probably quite influenced. Um, but again, this, you, uh, Jilla Brobar and... Um, uh, White Rose were Arthur Miller's dogs, very much a northern kennel. Again, we've started to see this shift towards the north of England. And for me, this was a very exciting time because this is when I started to get involved in the breed and really started to take an interest. Um, Quiller of Quillen. Um, I claim fame for this dog simply because I saw him when he was a nine-month-old puppy. He was at a show, South Eastern Counties Bull Terrier show in the puppy class. He didn't win the show that day, and I thought he should have done. And I spoke to his owners, and they were people at Bev and Wendy State, lovely people, and I became friends for life. Um, and I went up to the excited and said, this is a really good dog, you know. And they were very, very, um, very, what's the word, very modest about it. They were saying, oh, thank you very much. And, you know, I said, oh, I think you should have won today. And I re went home, and I rang up Joan Kenway. I said, Joan, I've seen the most fantastic dog. It's by Jacobinia. She says that, I said, Quill of Quill. Oh, yes, she said, he's going to win the Regent Trophy. So I thought, oh. <laughs> so she already, she'd already seen the dog. She handled the dog. He went to his title in three shows. He, became a, he, he won the Regent Trophy. But I'm going to say, I'm not going to say it because Eric's sitting in the room. He was lucky in that he, the, the other real top dog of the year was Aishai, uh, Eric on Chief Aishai. When I saw Aishai later in the year, I rang up Wendy say, I said, oh, God, I've seen a dog that's really going to push Quiller, you know, this, this dog. They went, so what a terrible thing to do to your friend who's expecting to win the Regent Trophy. And some, your, her friend is telling her there's a better dog. Now, I will say, um, Eric, dare I say you made a mistake. He was shown as a very, very young, immature dog. So much so that he even got a ticket withheld from him because the judge said he was too immature. But... <laughs> It was seven and a half months, there you are. The next year... Uh, well, you, okay, it was about 13 months. So... <laughs> yeah, th th never pick a fight with Eric. But the, the point I'm making is, next year, he won the Ormdy Jug with something to spare. So I think it was a case of, at his best, he was... Eric, you don't have to tell me. I'm one of the people that used your dog. <laughs> I used him before he went to America. So, um, but the point is, I'm just really trying to demonstrate that actually something, you have to have everything right. 
Um, there are, every dog has a tie, every dog has its day, what an expression that is. And certainly it was Ayshire's dick, and I'm not going to get into an argument whether he was a better dog. I used the dog at stud, so I think he was a great dog. But nevertheless, Quilla was a very, very good dog. Um, Maximilian Bully Boy of Jabrulu. I had a connection to this dog. I did say at the beginning, by the way, this is personal highlights, and it is because they're the things I know about, they're the things I can share with you. But Maximilian Bully Boy, when I ha we had our first ball terrier and would go to ring craft classes, there happened to be a bull terrier bitch there owned by some people called Mr. and Mrs. Bath. Now, she, wasn't, she was a, a fairly ordinary looking bitch, but they decided to mate her. They took her to Ormandy um, to mate her. They used Jack of, Jack of Dandy, who was the top star at the time, and they produced a litter of puppies. And they sold these puppies to pet homes. Bully Boy went to a, a family called Carol, Mr. and Mrs. Carol. Mr. and Mrs. Carol went on holiday and took Max into the Kenway's kennels. And Joan didn't take the dog. Bobby, her daughter, took the dogs into the kennels. And Bobby went into her mum and said, oh, mum, I've seen a really nice bull terrier. Someone's brought a really nice dog in. And Joan went out to look, and her eyes popped out of her head. And she said, God, this is a really good dog. And for two weeks, she had to wait all excitedly till the owners came back to collect him because she knew she wanted to try and buy a share in him. And sure enough, when they came back, they bought a share in him. Max had a great life because he'd go to shows with Joan and go to Joan's to do stud work, but he still lived as a family pet in the Carroll's house. So it was a wonderful situation. Had it not been for that, he never would have been found. He could have actually just been on the Carroll's couch and no one would have ever known he existed, but he won the Regent Trophy. That neatly brings you on to uh, champion Bella uh, Bianca Jacena who I believe was bought out of the Exchange and Mart. For those who don't know what the Exchange and Mart is, it's a little bit like Gumtree is today. It's probably one of the places you wouldn't choose to go and buy a dog. You certainly wouldn't expect to go and buy a Regent Trophy winner out off of Gumtree, but that's absolutely what happened. Um, she was shown, I was one of the first judges that judged her actually, and I didn't even place her first, that's how good I am. Um, but she was still a very, very good bitch. Um, on the day, I can, uh, my excuse is she didn't move. She was all over the place. And I couldn't even assess her movement. But sure enough, she went on to win the Regent Trophy. Um, I'm going to touch on um, Brandy Crusader was a fantastic dog. It was a very, that year was a very good year in that um, he was up against a half-brother. Someone help me out here. What was it? Tony Coop's dog. Royal Sovereign, uh, Royal Sovereign was, a, was a great dog, and that was the, the trophy, in my view, was between those two dogs. As it happened, Royal Sovereign went, to, went on and won the um, Ormandy Jug. Crusader won the uh, uh, region trophy. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> you can go now. <laughs> Dear. Um, so... The following year, now this is quite an important year for me because Brandy Black winner, there's no suggestion that he wasn't a, a good winner. He was the first tricolour ever to win the Regent Trophy. But in my view, um, the sensation of that show was a dog called Gabriel the Admiral, who was a son of Crusader. Now, it's very difficult with hindsight to describe um, the Admiral fairly, uh, fairly because he was a very, very faulty dog. He had lots of faults. He had poorly placed ears, he had a long back, he had a horrible top line, he had a horrible front. But he was still one of the most sensational dogs of the time and he had great virtues. So in a way, I always felt it was a bit of a tragedy, but I could completely understand why he hadn't won because he wasn't probably as sound all over as, as Brundy Black was. Uh, interestingly, the film of Brundy Black, that, that is available, I think it's available on video, and perhaps not DVD, but the interesting, uh, there's a very good scene um, of the dog coming into the ring. And Eileen Douglas Lindsay was the ring steward. She was the show manager at the time. And, and Eileen, I can tell you, ran the show with a rod of iron. And the dog comes in all excited. And as he goes past Eileen, he leaps up, tries to take a lump out of her. <laughs> I think only in excitement. It wasn't being nasty. And thankfully, Eileen just went like that and she, he, he missed her. But it could have been a disaster. <laughs> Um, so we move, move on um, to some, some really good dogs, and I'm going to talk about Boko now, Eric, you'll be pleased to hear, and Bob will as well. Um, I don't know whether Eric realises, Boko was only ever beaten twice. 
and I was responsible both times. I was responsible the first time because I judged him. I judged him as a very young dog at North East Bull Terrier Club, and I put a, an excellent dog called Sherry Star over him. Um, Sherry Star was a very good dog. I accept. You don't always get it right. The other, the other second time, I don't know if you remember this, Eric. I don't know why I'm picking on Eric. Um, the second time was at the Bull Terrier Club Open Show. Uh, we were showing our bitch admiration, and we got best bitch, Eric got best dog, and we beat Eric for best of breed. So I'm responsible for both Boko's both only two defeats. Um, Suicide Centurion, 1991. Um, I'm going to come back to Eileen Douglas Lindsay. This is a very interesting year because it was a, there was an epic battle for the Regent Trophy between this dog, uh, Swiss Centurion, and a dog called Warbonnet Buckskin. And it, it was a really close competition. And the two judges judging it were Phyllis McCombie um, and Audrey Edmund. And they took forever. They were up and down, up and down. And I can tell you, in those days, the show would go on for a long time. It was at Wood Green by this time. And the show would go on late into night. And Eileen Douglas Lindsay got a, used to get a taxi back from the show to, which was in East Anglia, to Croydon in Surrey. And um, so Eileen is the referee, and Eileen is looking at her watch, and this is going on. And I promise you, for 20 minutes, the two ladies were up and down, and they clearly could not agree. And at that point, there was a slow hand clap. The crowd are starting to slow hand clap. It really has taken that long at which point they call for the referee and I can tell you it was a dramatic performance because Eileen threw her, she put her coat on by this time ready to go, she threw her coat off and she literally rolled her sleeves up before she went into the ring. So great dra drama, Centurion won, but it was, a, it was quite a dramatic and exciting moment, I can say, I have to say. Um, I'm going to talk about cabin class, I'm afraid, it was not my winner. That, it was, of course, it was a hugely exciting year for me. It was our first ever winner. Um, he was a very successful dog. And, but what made it exciting, um, we, the show that year was held for the only time ever. It's been in a, a, it was in an epilepsy centre. And the room we were in was absolutely crammed. And for me, obviously it was a very exciting win anyway, but I, the excitement in that room, I, I can honestly say, I don't think there's ever been a year quite as exciting as that. Of course it was for me because we won, but actually it was that excitement that was created by being in such an enclosed space. Um, we move on to the next year, and I've got, I'll tell you a little bit about the stories of swag as well, because that's quite an important, clearly it's important for me, it's the second year we won. But I have to say that we didn't expect to win, and we didn't expect to win, certainly with, with Swaggin's role. Um, we had two animals in the same litter. There was a bitch called Swaggany Aunt, which um, I, I chose to show because I thought she was the better one. But what made it interesting was that Swaggin's role lived with a family, and for Christmas, they decided they were going to dye the dog pink as a surprise for the children. I know it's a, you, it's a difficult thing to understand that, that someone would do that, but they thought that it would be great for the children to come downstairs Christmas Day and they see the dog is pink. And that seemed funny at the time. The trophy show is in February, and so I say to them, can I have the dog back? I want to get him in the right weight. And when I phone them up, they say, oh, he might be the right colour by then. I thought that meant he'd be dirty, but no, he was pink. Well, I picked him up. And I promise you, in that week that I had him, he must have had at least 10 baths. I used every single product you could think to try to get this pink colour out. It, I thought it had come out. Um, for the day of the show, we covered him in, in chalk, but there was certainly no way I was going to take him in the ring. I made Carolyn take him in the ring. <laughs> and I can say, if you watch the video when he won, uh, Carolyn's face is a picture because they've called me out as runner-up with swag in the heart, and I'm excited. And then I realised it's going to be, uh, we called out for best opposite sex, so I thought a dog was going to win. And the, in, in fairness, the bitches I felt were stronger that year. And then Ka they called out Carolyn's number, and she's standing there dumbstruck. And I'm saying, come on, come on. <laughs> so obviously it was exciting. I don't want to go on too much about our own success. Um, so I just, 97 was an important year for me. That was the first year I ever, ever judged it. So again, it was an important year, and I thought this was a lovely bitch, very compact, small bitch. Um, 1999, again, I thought the Napier Jenny Wren was a, a super, super bitch. She was up against uh, Devil's Chance, I think, was the be best dog that year. 
and it was a really close contest. You could not have more, uh, more opposed animals. Jenny, Jenny Wren was a really strapping, big heavyweight bitch. Devil's Chance was much more terrier type. And I will say that Devil's Chance looked that day the best he'd ever looked. He, never, he was never a great dog in the show ring, but that day he looked absolutely superb. But he did get beaten. I'm not saying he didn't deserve to get beaten. It's, it's one of those decisions the judges could have gone either way. Um, I'm now going to talk about Thunderbolt, because that is a really interesting story to me. This is a, this is a, I thought this dog was a super dog. Um, he was a controversial dog in that he was extremely virtuous, a little bit like the Admiral. He was faulty in some ways, but he was a, a really fantastic heavyweight dog. And to me, he screamed stud dog, so, so much so that we used him at stud. Now, this is where the story gets interesting. This dog was called Snitch. Now, Snitch was the golden ball that is used in the, uh, the, in the Harry Potter films. They play Quidditch, and the Snitch is the golden Snitch, is the golden ball. The golden ball that flies around, okay? Um, a little bit later on, after his Regent Trophy winner, he, um, Snitch has some awards taken away from him because it's reported to the Kennel Club that he'd had a testicle removed because it was cancerous and he had a, a false testicle put in, a false ball put in. The ball was flown from Ireland. So you have a dog that's named after a flying ball that has a ball <laughs> flown from Ireland to put in. Um, and I, I have to say, I have no, I don't know whether that story is true or not. It's certainly true enough to have his awards taken away. The Kennel Club felt there was enough evidence there to take some of his awards away. I say in his defence, he was a great dog, lovely dog, um, and he, he didn't, um, we used him at stud, we produced puppies by him, so clearly that didn't affect him. But I think that actually happened before he had the testicle replaced. So just a little interesting story there surrounding that dog. Um, we move on now, and I say there's, there, I think we come to a point now where the winners that I see here were all really good winners of the trophy. Um, I don't think there was too many arguments. There may be people in the room who think other dogs should have won, but I think we've reached a period now where some of the really best dogs have really started to come to the top. From my own personal perspective, um, Devil's Essence was, was a really good winner for me in one way, but not so good in another way. I saw the bitch when she was very young, and Eric said to, um, sorry, Russell said to me, um, I'm going to show this bitch this year, and I said, Russell, you're mad, she's not mature enough, wait till next year, she'll be, look, look, look far, no, no, I'm determined to show her. Well, not only did the show her make her up, uh, I was the judge at the trophies, and actually she was good enough to win both the Regent Trophy and the Ormandy Jug, so I was completely wrong about how mature she was or how the hell she would be. Um, Cosmopolitan, she had a tough time, and I'm not suggesting she was a lucky winner, but she was, it was a very tough battle between her and a dog called Son of a Gun, uh, Tigwin Son of a Gun, and that to me was a really good year, and um, a really epic battle, battle between those animals. Um, Huntsman, again, was one of my favourite dogs, and we start to see the Emery Kennel start to take a very dominant place in the, in the world of all terrors at the Region Trophy Show. And then 2009, we see Eric come back in the ring. We haven't seen Eric by this point for quite a few years. He's not been anywhere. He's not been at a show. And suddenly Eric comes back with a fantastic bitch and wins the Regent Trophy. Some of us were delighted to see him, but I'm sure there were lots of others that weren't so pleased to see him. Um, Visions, for me, was an interesting dog in that I saw him the year before the trophies. He was third in the puppy class that year. And I remember saying to Carolyn, that dog's going to win the region trophy next year. And sure enough, he did. Um, so I was actually, and I, I should say, I also judged that year as well. Um, as I said, we come on, and I honestly think we've reached a period now where these dogs were all good winners. Uh, Paper Gangster, to me, was a fantastic, phenomenal dog. Real, real, what I would call a real stud dog. Um, and we go on to another dog I pick out is Top Gun. Now this was, an in, for me, he was a surprising dog because that was a really strong year in the trophies and I can remember watching from the ringside and I, I have to be honest, I overlooked Top Gun to start off with. He was stuck in the corner, he was coloured, 
which he sort of merged into the background. But I remember when Alison brought him into the middle of the ring, suddenly he started to look at this dog. And he's one of these dogs that the more you look at him, the better he gets. And I was lucky enough, um, about two years later, I had to make a video for the Kennel Club about the Bull Terrier. And Alison let me use him. And when you go over the dog piece by piece, he's actually a phenomenal dog. He's a very, very difficult dog to fault. Um, and that he's, but he's, I suppose it's one of those things you see a coloured dog sometimes merge into the background. He's not even, he's, he's reasonably well marked, but he's, there's something about him that actually you really, one of those dogs you really have to touch to appreciate. Unlike Devil's Tristar, who again to me was a dog, I gave him his second ticket, and to me he was an easy, easy dog to win because he was a, a phenomenal, powerful dog, um, a dog that, that you could not fail to recognise and fail to appreciate the moment you saw him. Um, Torbar Stunlight, uh, uh, Torbar Starlight, uh, sorry, Torbar Starlight, um, I, I saw her at the East Anglia show and I remember going back to Carolyn and said I've just seen the Regent Trophy winner because she was a phenomenal bitch and again I felt head and shoulders around, around the, uh, among, uh, above the others. And finally we come on to last year, um, Devil's Brew, who I described recently as one of the greats when I judged, I, had, I was lucky enough to judge him fairly recently and he's another dog, I seen him earlier, Carolyn had given him a CC I think, um, about a year before and he was a dog that matured into what I consider is really one of the greats. So that's a potted history of the trophy show. Um, we don't know who's going to win it in 2019 but what I hope I've shown you is that actually it's not necessarily an easy ride. It's a very difficult show to predict. Lots of things can happen along the way, and there's lots of little, little incidents surrounding it. And I think that's what makes this trophy so important. There is so much history attached to this, show, to this, this trophy. I've been coming for 40 years, um, which is only half as long as this trophy exists, and there's so much hi history literally oozes out of it. Um, we said the show was about improvement. The, the forefathers of our breed decided that dog shows were about improvement. And I'll leave it to you, if you to say whether you think we've improved or not. I know what my opinion is. Um, I don't think that Brendan Becky would stand much of a chance in the ring today. But without Brendan Becky, we wouldn't have uh, any other of the bull terriers that are in the ring today. So again, it's where the history has actually taken us. Um, so there's a quick summary for you about the trophies. The trophy's been going for 89 years. We've had 15 different venues, six in central London, five in the commentary area. Um, we've had 81 winners, 72 whites, nine coloreds, five brindles, one black brindle, two tricolours, one red. And there we have the most successful kennels, with Superlative having seven wins, Ormandy five, and the M Red kennels had five. And there's been others with three and uh, three others with three and seven others with two. So this trophy has got so much history right from those early years to today. It's, it's been part of my life and it's clearly been part of your lives because that's why you're here today to listen to me ramble on about it. A um, couple of questions for you. If you see how much you've been paying attention, um, who's held, which dog's held the trophy for the longest? That's it, one at the end of the year, uh, what war? war? Yeah, so that was McGuffin, he, he held it over the war years. The only dog that's held it more than a year. Um, what colour dogs have ever won? So, sorry? Fawn, yes, fawn. Um, how many dogs, how many bitches? 49 dogs, 32 bitches. Um, which exhibitors went the most years between competing? Eric, Eric, Eric. No, Audrey Edmund. Audrey Edmund competed in 1953 and then came and won it in 1984. And finally, another question for you, and it won't really come out in there. Um, which exhibitor exhibited for the longest period of time at, in, the, in the Regent Trophy for the most years? No. No, Joyce Schuster. Joyce Schuster competed in 1941 and again in 1981. So she competed all throughout that, 40, not every year, but she competed for 40 years. 
So, I think that's about it. That's just a picture of some of my dogs. That's the best part of Bull Terriers to me, is, is the dogs you have at home. Um, it, this is what makes their life, but it shows are really important, but it's also what they do for you at home. So, thank you very much. I hope I haven't bored you, and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you.